and that gets him fired up here at Taylor Field as the Stampeder starts riding Wally Buono. His team now leading 13 to 7. So far, look at the problems. Three fumbles, one interception. Calgary, four fumbles and one interception. That's when they played each other on August 6th. And the fans here, 54,000 in attendance. I would say 53,000 are rooting for, uh, for Calgary. At least. At least. Because you've got basically the Baltimore players, wives, girlfriends, and grandmothers. And that's about it. <laughs> Look at these guys. Gus, we saw guys like that every night in the streets this week of Regina. Mark McLaughlin kicking off from the 35. A drive kick. Scooped up at the 30-yard line by Chris Wright. Heads up the sidelines and gets wiped out shy of the 50. You see another situation in the open field with some slippage. And that time, trying to make the cut, Chris Wright, nobody even touched him. He went down. And with a quick comment, here's our Lisa Bowes. Thanks, Gus. Obviously, Doug Flutie was in some kind of pain because they just gave him a shot of something, obviously a painkiller, to dull his bruised tailbone. So just want to let you guys know, he just took a shot. Guys? Well, all the women in, across the United States concerned about Doug's tailbone. <laughs> first down to 10 from the 47. Ham passing on first down to the far side. Complete. This is Robert Drummond. And he'll get down to the 45-yard line, pick up of 20 yards. Now, Drummond, third year out of Syracuse. A little busted coverage. Coleman takes off for the deep middle of the field. No linebacker replaces. Drummond wide open. He catches the ball as well as a wide receiver. Great speed. As 4-4 speed, spent three years with the Philadelphia Eagles. First down from the 45. Ham firing. Robert Clark hauls it in and he gets inside the 25 at the 23 yard line. Defensively Al Jordan for Calgary. Two but plays in a row where the Calgary defense A can't get to Ham and B laid way off the receiver. Good throw by Tracy Ham. That's about a 40 yard pass from one hash mark all the way outside the numbers to Clark. Nobody anywhere near him. Kenton Leonard comes in late. 65 yard width of the field. So throwing to the sidelines is always a long throw. First down from the 23. Ham in trouble, gets it off incomplete. Robert Drummond, the intended receiver. That, that was a blitz by inside linebacker Matt Finley, number 37. He only has one sack on the entire season, so that's unlike Calgary. A little change up. Finley coming on the blitz, and that forced Ham to get rid of the football more quickly than he wanted to. Finley in his 10th season out of Eastern Michigan, playing in his last football game today. Unless he can't sell enough stocks, you will see him next year. A stockbroker during the offseason. Second down and 10 from the 23. Blitz. Ham, plenty of time. Underneath, incomplete. Mike Pringle, wide open, bobbles the football and drops it. That was the wrap on Pringle when he first came into the lake, that he couldn't catch the football coming out of the backfield. He's pretty much put that to rest. He had 33 catches this year. He's an excellent receiver. I think we've got another busted assignment. Look, nobody anywhere near him. He fights the football. He got advantage of those kinds of opportunities in big games. Brings on Carlos Huerta. 9 of 14 in the playoffs. This is a 30-yard attempt. Carlos does not use a tee unless field conditions are horrible. Good snap, good hold, good kick. And Huerta splits the uprights and the Stallions now trail 13 to 10. 12 9 left here in the second quarter of play. We've got a three-point ball game as Calgary gets ready to go back on offense. Gus Johnson, Mike Mayock with, with you. This is the 83rd Grey Cup from Taylor Field in Regina. Saskatchewan, 54,000 crazy fans enjoying a brisk day of football you know, in Gus, the CFL. In the 83 years they've had the Cup, this is the first time it's come to Regina, which is about as football crazy as it gets. And the only way I can equate it to people in the States is it's kind of like a Pittsburgh. They love their football, they take it very seriously, but because of the weather 
considerations. They've never had it here before. The people of Regina did a great job setting the whole week up, taking care of everybody. Look at them. They love it here. And in terms of the weather, things may get a little uglier. Flurries starting to come down right now as Calgary takes over. First down at 10 from the 35. Play fake, Flutie. Man to man. Up top to Sapungis, incomplete. Ball was underthrown to David Sapungis, and he became a defender as Ken Watson almost came up with the interception. Ken, Kenny Watson's been busy early in this game. Slightly beat, the ball's underthrown. Now it's a jump ball. Good position by Watson. Sponges turns into a defender. That's the third knockdown early in the second quarter for Ken Watson. David Sponges had 10 receptions for 98 yards when they faced Baltimore at McMahon Stadium. Second down and 10. Screen pass, Sponges, and he goes nowhere, wrapped up at the 40-yard line. Great looking tackle by Tracy Gravely. <laughs> Tracy Gravely, Charles Anthony did a great job on the recognition. It's a little slip screen underneath. Anthony's man, it's man to man. Watch Gravely coming from the right side of your screen. Makes the hit, there's Gravely. Charles Anthony dumps him down. And that will force the Stampeders to punt. No, we want to go too quick. <laughs> Get a little feedback from Doug. I think he said, oh, man. Tony Martino, third punt of the game, standing at the 26-yard line. Low punt, fielded, bobbled, but Chris Wright jumps on it, and he'll get over the 35 up to the 37-yard line. Flags are on the play. Looks like another no yards penalty. Because of the type of punting game we're going to have today, I wouldn't be surprised to see a few more of those kind of penalties. Only a five-yard return, 35-yard punt. Here's Dave Ewell. First time. Remember, five-yard bubble is the rule. He fumbles it. You've got number 87, Kevin Reed, within the five yards. That's why the flag was thrown. First down from the 43. Here's Ham throwing on first down, stepping up. And Tracy Ham takes it, gets out of bounds at the 50-yard line. And that's what he can do. And Tracy Ham running the football, it'll keep this Calgary defense honest. I think we're going to get a holding call that will take that back. But Frank Spaziani, the defensive coordinator for Calgary, told me before the game, he can handle Mike Pringle. He knows what Pringle brings to the table. He knows what their wide receivers could do. But the guy that scares him is Tracy Ham on the corner. And there is Wally Buono. The first man you had a chance to take a look at was Don Matthews. Wally's saying, take him back. It's not even a question. Buono, one and one in Grey Cups. The last time he won it in 1992. Major foul, face mask. Baltimore 64, 15 yards, first down repeat. That's Mark Dixon, second year right guard out of the University of Virginia. And here comes Will Johnson. When you're blocking him on pass, look at the right hand right there. No problem with that's a good call by the refs. Dixon all over the face mask. It's so difficult to block Will Johnson when he's going upfield on the pass. First down and long for the Stallions. They swing it out of the backfield to Pringle. And he gets upended at the 35. Marvin Coleman coming out of his right quarterback position to make the hit. Marvin Coleman, all 5'9", 163 in the open field. He said, hey, I'm going low on this guy. Look at Marvin break on the football, number 17. Oh, look at the block. Drummond on McClanahan. It doesn't get any better than that block right there. Second down, 17 from the 35. Ham again, firing it downfield for Culver! Incomplete. Skinny Culver had at least two steps on the closest Calgary defender, but Tracy Ham just couldn't put it on him. Defensive ends Marvin Pope and Will Johnson are starting to get up the field and put pressure on Ham. 
You know what's interesting, Gus? When you have the wind, sometimes it can be as difficult to throw a long pass with the wind as against it because the ball tends to sail on you. Josh Miller punting from the 21-yard line. His third punt. Average 47.7 yards per punt on the year, but so far his numbers are down, only 35 yards. And he gets off a bomb here, driving Terry Vaughn back to the 20-yard line. Vaughn turning it upfield, and he's wrapped up at the 25 by Charles Anthony. 55-yard punt, a six-yard return. 9.15 left in the second quarter of play. Calgary holding on to a three-point lead. Back in Regina, Calgary leading 13 to 10. Top of the show, we talked exclusively about the wind and what it would do to both offenses and kicking games. You can see the Baltimore pendant right there. We've had gusts anywhere from 25 to 50 miles an hour. And you could see the average for Josh Miller. He's a 47 yard average. Against the wind, he was 33. With the wind right there, he was 50 plus. Just shows you the difference. Wally Buono knows it. So in the fourth quarter, Calgary will have the wind advantage. They, they won the kick, they won the coin toss rather, and they chose to defer. So they'll get their chance. They might not get the football in the third quarter, but what they want is the wind in the fourth quarter with a chance to win the football game. Right now, with 9:15 left in the second quarter, they'll have it at their own 35-yard line, leading 13-10. Check that from the 26. Stewart running off tackle. And he's wrapped up by Matt Goodwin at the 27-yard line. Matt Goodwin last year was the CFL's most outstanding rookie and has turned in another quality performance this season with 50 tackles. He's, he's an excellent football player out of Iowa State. Defensive back who they made an outside linebacker. Remember, Don Matthews told us this team was set up to play Calgary. He's got two safeties playing outside linebackers, so they believe in speed, speed, and then a little more speed. Pickup of only three, second down and seven from the 29. Flutie, option to the far side. Stewart, nowhere to go as he's wrapped up. Once again by the pursuing Stallions defense, Matt Goodwin getting there in a hurry. In a lateral game, in a game of quickness, you are not going to out-quick Matt Goodwin. He's just too quick as an outside linebacker. Little option, trying to get the ball to store it outside. Matt Goodwin makes a great play. Gain of only two, and that will bring on the punting unit. You've noticed, Gus, so far in the second quarter, Calgary hasn't gone into their no, their no huddle offense once. They're trying to melt the clock against the wind. Tony Martino standing at the 17-yard line. Chris Wright inches up closer now. He's at his own 47. Field position battle. And it's blocked. O.J. Brigands gets a piece of it. Ball heading towards the end zone. It's been all special teams so far for the Stallions. A punt return for a touchdown, and now a block punt by O.J. Brigance with that man, Dirty Walt, scoring the touchdown. Watch what happens. It's a good snap. One step, two step, three steps, too long. Here comes Brigance with the block. And Alvin Walton, the former Redskin, number four, does a great job of locating the football, catching it on the hop, and getting into the end zone. Alvin Walton leads his team in special teams tackles. He's a special teams player of the year for Baltimore. And in the right place at the right time last year in the Great Cup, had an interception that he laddled off for a touchdown. 7.39 remaining, Baltimore back on top, 17-13. Is O.J. Brigance. He blocked the punt that Alvin Walton recovered and got into the end zone for the touchdown. And O.J. Brigance, he's a warrior playing in his 90th consecutive game. In five years, he's never missed a football game. And there are the turnovers, one apiece resulting in scores for both teams. But the difference in the football game is two special teams touchdowns for Baltimore, totaling 14 of their 17 points. O.J. Brigance out of 
Rice was an all-Southwest Conference linebacker playing for the Owls. Also was an all-Western Conference player when he played for the BC Lions. It's a stack right there to the right of your screen. Here he comes. They stacked in the middle. He came loose on the outside. And Alvin Walton does a great job picking it up and diving in the end zone. So Walton gets all the publicity, but Bergantz made the play. Alvin Walton, as we told you, intercepted a pass last year and lateraled it to one of the Anthony brothers for a touchdown against BC. From the 15, Coleman running up the sidelines and he's wrapped up at the 30-yard line. Coleman didn't like that late hit by uh, Alvin Walton either. Alvin Walton, who just scored the touchdown, had 34 special teams hits this year and was the special player of the week for Baltimore seven times. The guy's just an animal. He was an uh, all-league strong safety for the Redskins and just continuing to play extremely well. Stampeders with the ball at the 31-yard line. First down as you take a look at beautiful scenic shot of Taylor Field. Is that our blimp? Play action. Flutie has it batted down at the line of scrimmage. That's over Payton, and he looks right into the face of Doug Flutie. <laughs> look, Payton can get it going a little bit, too. They call his nickname Swack because he played in the Southwest Athletic Conference. Number 56. He knows he's not going to get to Doug, so he's just going to jump up, elevate, knocks it down, and then he's going to go find Doug and tell him about it. Second down and 10 for the Stamps at the 31. He got a block, Peyton, 18 sacks this year. Here's Flutie again under pressure. Gets it off, incomplete, intended for Allen Pitts. No flags on the play, and Flutie gets leveled as he releases the football. Flutie got leveled, and Pitts got mauled coming off the line of scrimmage. Charles Anthony grabbed him. Watch this. Anthony, left hand, right hand. He misses him here. Now he's going to hold him. He's going to hold him again. Allen pushes off, and the ball's just a little bit overthrown. Good man-to-man -man coverage. Here comes Peyton. He's a tough guy to block, and there's the hit on Flutie. Calgary offense unable to get anything going. Here's Martino, fourth punt of the game. Standing at his own 17, Chris Wright at the 50-yard line. Low punt. Wright slips, ball bounces backwards no yards flags have been thrown and the whistle has finally been blown at midfield <laughs> Martino's gonna lose that battle with OJ McGann's every time and I'll tell you what they ran the same stack play Matt Goodwin came clean almost blocked that punt Calgary having all kinds of problems blocking the pressure of the Baltimore front 25 yard punt by Tony Martino As a player, I always got nervous when these guys started huddling up. You never knew what they were going to come out with. And Dave Ewell will tell us. We have illegal interference on the receiver. 15-yard penalty, 51 Calgary, first down. That's Alondra, Alondra Johnson. And Wally Buono can't believe it on the Calgary sideline. And that will give the Stians go position at the 40-yard line with 6.21 left to go in the second quarter of play. There's A.J. Now they're in that same alignment they were in when they fumbled a little while ago. Look at the deep eye set with the mo late motion. And they give it to Pringle straight ahead and he'll pick up a couple. Gonzalo Floyd as well as Matt Finley on the tackle for the Stamps. You know, so far, Calgary's defense has been more than up to the challenge of Mike Pringle. Seven carries for 41 yards. Will Johnson head-to-head -head with Sharp Radonish. There's a matchup of a couple studs right there. Both of them all league players. Little standoff. Second down and eight. Steps up, delivers, incomplete. Robert Clark 
had a chance to make a catch. Would have been a tough one, but one he should have made. That's the third time tonight Robert Clark had a chance to make a play and came up empty. Get the athletic ability here. Marvin Pope working on big Neil Fort. 330 pounds against 250. And the Stallions offensive line doing a good job. This is the same line for the sixth consecutive week. And Carlos Huerta in to attempt a 45-yard field goal. And it's good. But there are flags on the play. That was a third and seven situation. The back judge underneath the goalpost threw the flag, which is highly unusual. There's no infraction on the play. Field goal is good. So an inadvertent flag and the field goal stands. So with 5-11 left in the second quarter, Baltimore leads 20-13. And Doug Flutie connect for a 27-yard gain. So the Stamps have it first down and 10 from the 48-yard line of Baltimore. Flutie out of the shotgun. Thrown to the sidelines. Tony Stewart out of the backfield. Runs over the first defender and gets inside the 40. Down close to the 35. Charles Anthony pushing him out of bounds. Doug Kraft getting run over on the play. Good job by Flutie taking what the defense will give him, which in this case is halfback Tony Stewart underneath the zone coverage. And when he catches the football, he's just going to run. Douglas Kraft, his ex-teammate, right there. First down again, but they're going to measure. Tony Stewart, 56 receptions for 504 yards on the season to go along with 735 yards rushing. But when you talk about the most prolific passing team in the CFL. You talk about Terry Vaughn had 72 catches. Sapunjas, 111. Pitts, 100. You lose Pee Wee Smith, who had 58 catches, but your running back still had 56. So, and that doesn't account for, did you count for Mitch Danielson? Well, everybody, you're exactly right. He had over 50. Everybody talks about the slots on this team, but everybody produces and they spread the football around. Flutie and Garcia, great job going to everybody one time or another. First down from the 38. Flutie gets rid of it quickly and in his face again was Alfred Payton and he continues to talk to Doug Flutie. And Doug is probably going to get tired of seeing him. <laughs> He's a fiery guy on the field. I spent about 10 minutes, 15 minutes with him at practice yesterday. He's a very low-key guy, but look at him right there. He's like shot out of a gun on that one. They were trying to pull the guard, but the guard had no chance he was out there so quickly. All Southwest Conference, Southwest Athletic Conference player for Eddie Robinson at Grambling. Second down and 10 from the 38. Flutie, buying some time, flushed out of the pocket, and it's broken up. Broken up at the last moment by Chris Johnson, the starting free safety, first-year player out of San Diego State. Did a nice job following Flutie and then breaking late on the football. That's what differentiates a good defensive back from an average one, an ability to break on the football. Chris Johnson did a great job there. Johnson trying to come up with his fifth interception in seven games. He's the fifth man to play free safety for the Stallions this year. Now, last year when they went to the Cup, Gus, all five of their starters played in every single game. This year, the defensive backs for Baltimore have been beat up. They've lost Lester Smith, Carl Anthony. And here's Mark McLaughlin, a 44-yard field goal attempt into the wind. Against the wind. Looks like it's died down a little bit, but before the game, he couldn't get close from here. Doug Flutie is his holder. It's no good. Shanked. <laughs> oh, man. I guess it really isn't any good, is it? And that uh, was like a three iron that, that, that just ugly from the minute you hit it. So McLaughlin trying to drive. 
He shanks it off his foot, and Baltimore holds on to a 2013 lead. Quad has become so successful is because Jim Sparrow's hired that man. Don Matthews, a Canadian coach with experience in the Canadian Football League, and when he built this team, he had a pretty good model. Well, I think what we've got is a bad weather football team. I think that if the weather's bad, and the, the we when I say weather, the wind, if the wind really affects the passing game in a bad manner, then I think the advantage goes to the team that can run the football, and we've been running it all year, so we've got a tailback and an offensive line that used to doing that, and I think that uh, that would be to our advantage. Don Matthews talking about the weather conditions favoring yeah, he kind of been, he's hoping all week for bad weather because he thinks it takes Doug Flutie out of the offense and just lets him run his normal tailback-oriented offense. First down and 10, Ham spots his receiver. This is Chris Armstrong, his first catch of the game, but he goes down at the 12. When they throw the football, that's the guy they've got to start to find, Chris Armstrong. Robert Clark has dropped three already. Armstrong's one of the best wide receivers in this league. Big, strong guy, 6'2", 200 pounds, runs a 4'5". Both of them slip on the field. Armstrong's called down. But, Gus, they got to find a way in the pass game to get him the football. Armstrong, 64 catches on the year for 1,111 yards. Second down and seven. Ham, all day, and he goes down. Shrek goes this a COVID. Managed to serve through the line of scrimmage, and he comes up with the sack. You hear people talk about a coverage sack. That's exactly what that was. Tracy had plenty of time. He gets off the block of number 66, Neil Fort, and Shreko Zizakovic makes the play. Now, I had a chance before the game today down in the locker room to talk to Shreko about. He's a Canadian-born kid, but he went to Ohio State. We won't talk about John Cooper and the Ohio State Club this year. Miller punting out of his own end zone. Wobbly kick. Gets over the head of Marvin Coleman. Takes a Baltimore bounce and goes all the way down to the 37-yard line. That is huge. The fact that the ball was not handled by Calgary now puts them on the long field into the wind. Big, big leg by Josh Miller. 69-yard punt by Miller. Great punt by Miller, but inexcusable with a double safety back not to be able to handle that football. Marvin Coleman misjudging the ball as it goes over his head. Yeah, they had a double safety, and Marvin had to be best saved him 20 yards. So Flutie takes over at the 38. Trailing 20 to 13. They set up the screen on the near side, right through the wickets of David Zapudges. Through the wickets. Through the wickets. You a cricket player? Oh, well, you know, I, I watch it every now and then. I think <laughs> I got that on Sports Center somewhere. I like that. That was good. Through the wickets. Remind me of Bill Buckner. <laughs> I'm sure Boston fans are familiar with that. So David Zapudges and Flutie, unable to hook up there, makes it second down and 10. As you take a look at John Huffnagel, the offensive coordinator for Calgary. Flutie, short drop, plenty of time. Checks off two receivers finally underneath. And Tony Stewart can't hang on to the football as Chris Johnson is there defensively for Baltimore. Excellent coverage by Baltimore. Huffnagel actually sent six receivers, including his running back, Tony Stewart, into the pattern. But they were all covered. Flutie forced to eat the ball and then throw it late. Baltimore defense doing an excellent job of containing this high-powered offense from Calgary. And they'll get the ball again. A minute, 55 seconds left to go in the first half of play, leading 20 to 13. Martino at the 24-yard line. Good snap. And a wobbly kick, which is actually heading backwards. Watch Martino. He's going to recover it himself. 
And there's Chris Wright, picks up the ball, gets out of bounds at the Calgary 50. Now they ref threw a flag for no yards, but he shouldn't have thrown it because Tony Martino, the punter, is allowed within the five-yard bubble. They're going to talk about it and wave that flag off. Great hustle play. Bad kick by Martino, but great hustle play. A 12-yard punt by Tony Martino. No yards. Calgary 83. Five-yard penalty. First down. So they call it against Tyrone Williams instead of calling it against Tony Martino. Martino was within the five yards. I don't I I think that was a bad call. But anyway. Great field position for Baltimore. From the Calgary 46-yard line. Tracy Ham out of the shotgun. Three receivers to the far side. And it's almost intercepted. Marvin Coleman almost stepped in and picked that one off. He's got three interceptions in two plays at two against Hamilton. And don't ever throw the ball late across the field with Marvin Coleman in coverage. Look at it. He actually even overran the football. He had such a good break on it. Tracy Ham should have never thrown the football there. Second down and 10 from the 46. Coleman also out of Central State. A Northern Division All-Star this season at six interceptions on the year. Ham under pressure. Fires incomplete. Skinny Cove the intended receiver, but a flag is thrown. Maybe pass interference against the Stampeders. Al Jordan covering for Calgary. Penalty's going to be on Baltimore. The only question is whether or not Calgary will take the holding penalty or not. Holding. Baltimore number 64. Penalties decline. Third down. Now the question there, remember, Baltimore's with the wind. Mark Dixon holds number 64. Middle of your screen. You can see right there the, the jersey of Gonzalo Floyd stretching. But the point is right now, he declined the penalty, which is the safe play. 53-yard attempt by Huerta, but he's got the wind with him. So Carlos Huerta will attempt the 52-yarder. 53-yarder. And it looks like it's long enough, and it's good. Huerta nails the 53-yard field goal. And Baltimore, with a minute and 30 seconds remaining in the first half, they go up 23-13. to But that was my point. Do you take the holding penalty there to force him back out of field goal position, or do you force him to kick that? He was 3-for-6 during the year, over 50 yards, so you know he's got the leg for it. Huerta, in only two seasons, has become the most accurate kicker in CFL history. He's 95 of 118. And generally, Gus, he does not kick with a tee because he's trying to show the NFL he's ready to step right in and play next year. Calgary down 23-13. Here's Tony Stewart. Running on the delayed handoff, finally dragged down by Anthony. Gain of seven. Good call out of the shotgun. Little draw with a minute and 25 left in the first half. Picks up about eight yards. Down 10 points going into the wind here. They've got to try and figure out a way to get some points on the board before half. Clock still running. Second down and two from the 43 for the Stampeders. Stewart, the lone setback. And here he is running off tackle again. And no room at all for him as Demetrius Maxey comes up with the hit. Win from the outside. Maxey, the big defensive tackle from the inside. Nowhere to go. You know, Maxie's one of those guys they picked up during the season. Big, strong inside guy. Doesn't get to the quarterback a whole lot, but he's great against the run. Maxie, also out of UTEP, was a teammate with Gonzalo Floyd. I don't forget, coming up at halftime, Larry Smith, the commissioner of the CFL, and Jim Spiros will be talking with our Mike Mayock. Lisa hits the town with Jeff Garcia's home video camera. And we'll also have the 1995 CFL Player Awards. Good stuff. There's Flutie and Huffnagel talking. John Huffnagel was a quarterback at Penn State under Joe Paterno. 
Also played in the NFL and here in the CFL. He played 12 years up here, played three years for Denver. Great football guy. A minute 13 left in the half. Third down and two, Flutie with a blocker in front of him. He is going to take this one himself and pick up the first down. And he gets to the 50-yard line, Matt Goodwin with the tackle. That's Doug's favorite play, probably going back to Natick High School, certainly at Boston College. Little bootleg action, and Jamie Crisdale, his center, 67, will come out in front of him. See the fake to Tony Stewart. Crisdale, number 67 in front. It's a planned run all the way, first and 10. First down from the 51, Flutie in trouble. And he runs and is hauled down from behind. That's Maxie again. Second time we've called his name. And Flutie will only pick up about three yards on the play. When you, when you rush a guy that like Flutie that can run the football, spacing between your four front men is critical so there's no gaps. That's a great job by Maxie falling back off and making the play. 43 seconds remaining in the half. That was second down and nine. Incomplete, but it's caught. This is Pitts, right place at the right time. That's Alan Pitts' first catch of the half, and he's lucky the football eventually got to him. Hey, a little nothing wrong with a little bit of luck. Break on the football, it goes through two people, and Alan says, okay, I'll take it. Alan Pitts looking the ball in. Great concentration there. First down from the 41. Flutie in trouble again, and he goes down at the 46-yard line. That's Ra Demetrius Maxey coming up with the sack at the 46. Big half for Demetrius Maxey just in this series. That's three consecutive plays that that man has made. We have flags down. I think it's going to be offsides, Calgary, and decline. Calgary 18. Second down. Wally Buono has to come up with something now. We've got under a minute. We're down to 22 seconds and counting. They're outside a field goal range. Five-yard loss. They set up the screen. Here's Stewart. He loses his footing and gets back to the original line of scrimmage. Tracy Gravely made the force on that. All it does, as Gus just said, is back to the line of scrimmage, the 42-yard line. You've got to get closer for a more realistic field goal opportunity. So are you surprised with the way this Calgary offense has looked here in the first half? Let's face it, neither offense has really been explosive. Baltimore gets 14 points off the special teams. Calgary has sputtered, especially against the wind. Second half will tell the side. I really believe this game will go into the fourth quarter with either team having a chance to win the football game. Calgary averaging 434 yards per game in total offense. 355 yards passing, led by that man there, Doug Flutie. But right now, his team operating with a deficit, trailing 23 to 13. 12 seconds, you're trying to get one completion down the field, close enough for a field goal attempt. Out of the gun. There it is. Near side, incomplete. Terry Vaughn misjudging the football. You also saw the effects of the wind, throwing directly into the wind. The ball sailed on him a little bit. He's wide open in the flat. This would have put it into field goal range. Watch what happens. Just a little bit over Terry Vaughn's outstretched hands, and that's going to bring up a long third down situation. The question is field goal. Check that. First and 10, Baltimore. Stampeders turn it over on downs. From the 42, seven seconds left in the half. Looking for a big completion underneath incomplete. Intended for Chris Armstrong. Tracy Ham has been under throwing his receivers today. Really a tough win to gauge. Wins behind you sometimes, swirling sometimes. So with only three seconds remaining, second down and 10 for Baltimore from the 42. This will be the last play of the half. Ham will let it go. Drummond 
at the 50, and he goes down inside the 50. Marvin Coleman making the tackle for the Stampeders. So at the end of one half of play, the Baltimore Stallions will head into the locker room with a 23 to 13 lead in this, the 83rd Great Cup from Taylor Field in Regina. Once again, Gus Johnson, Mike Mayock. Very interesting, as you talked about, the special teams really uh, making the difference here in the first half. Well, we heard Don Matthews say to win the football game, Chris Wright had to make a play. What happens? First punt return, bang, 82 yards, touchdown. But then after that, they block the punt. O.J. Bergantz does a great job. Alvin Walton picks it up for a touchdown. 14 points off special teams advantage Baltimore. In terms of adjustments for both offenses in the second half, what do you think needs to be made? Well, let's be honest about it. Both offenses were sporadic at best. Calgary came out with a no-huddle fire offense in the first quarter. Pure conservative in the second quarter. Be interesting to see what they do with the wind in the second half. Well, Baltimore leading with one half remaining here in the Grey Cup. And coming up at halftime, we've got a full schedule, including a talk with the commissioner, Larry Smith, as well as Baltimore's Jim Sparrow. So stay with us. We'll have more from the 83rd Grey Cup right after this quick commercial timeout. Stay with us, everybody. Regina, Saskatchewan, where the Baltimore Stallions at halftime leading the Calgary Stampeders by a score of 23 to 13. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Mayock, and I'm joined here at halftime by the commissioner of the CFL, Larry Smith. And, Larry, pretty interesting first half of football. Well, Mike, you know, with the weather conditions, it was really a half that depended on special teams. And uh, both teams are really going at it. But Baltimore's got great special teams. Chris Wright opens it up, block the punt. There you go, 14 points in a game like this. That's big time. Okay, Larry, let's talk a little bit about what's going to happen with the CFL. Big day coming up to preface this for the American public on November 29th, the Board of Governors meets. Larry, you're in the fourth year of a five-year contract. Do you expect them to come out with a vote of confidence for you? Well, I would think so. Uh, I think we've done a lot of positive things, Mike, and uh, obviously our expansion in the state straight now is we're, uh, we're under some duress because uh, Jim Spiros may have to move in Baltimore. We may have a couple of other guys who have to move also, but, you know, we never thought it would be easy, but I think it's going to work out, and the owners feel the same way. Well, let's talk about the expansion. It's really a tough situation. The Canadian Football League needed money. You guys expand into the states. There's a fee that comes into it. You've been criticized by some people for expanding too, qu too quickly. Yet, do you feel like the league subsiding, continuing, depends on the expansion. Well, I think that expansion has done two things. One, it's regenerated interest in Canada. And two, we have started to penetrate the United States. It's a big market, but it's a four down football market. We're coming in with a slightly different product, which we excellent. The feedback we've received from the fans in U.S. cities is very positive, but it takes time, Mike. You have to be patient. <laughs> now listen, five teams south of the border, one run by Jim Spiros in Baltimore, had a great year. The other four somewhat questionable as far as fan support how many communities will be in the same places they were last year south of the border? Well, I think, Mike, we may have two to three teams potentially moving this year. But, uh, you know, the most important thing is we get Jim reestablished. We get some commitment out of our U.S. owners. We can make this work in the States because the fans watching the game see constant action. The other thing is it's affordable pricing. We got a 104-year-old institution. Even though it's from Canada, we're giving something the American fans want because it's so darn expensive to go to other professional sports games. Quickly, give me an economic snapshot of the league as it stands today. Well, we're very stable from a league perspective. Our Canadian operations have improved dramatically. We have to get our U.S. operations more established, build up our fan base, build up local sponsorship. We'll be okay. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner Larry Smith. Good luck next year with the expansion. And please stay tuned because coming up next, we're going to have a great week with Jeff Garcia, who took some videos of his own, both here in Regina, down in the field, and everywhere. Jeff, I was in the locker room after the game. You guys were all pumped up, and I think I even saw you walking around with a video camera, didn't I? Oh, yeah, it was great. Here, take a look. Good job, Willis. Right on, baby. Go on. All right, all right. You know what I'm saying? I like that. I hear you. Jamie. Is that all you can say, Jamie? Right on. Celebration time. Hey, remember that? 
so we were practicing, right? All right. And we'll practice on three again. Practice on three again next week. Mine's lighter. I see you, Vinny. Good game, baby. Sweet, buddy. Sweetness. What you got to say, Martino? Come on, you're better than that. Give me, give me something. Defensive player this year, Edmonton's Willie Pless. Five straight years as the Eskimos' top defensive player. Pless led the league this year with 100 tackles. And the most important thing that my mom always told me was to do the best I could in everything I do. And her last acknowledgement was, Willie, go out and play the game. Outstanding rookie again from Edmonton, Shalon Baker. The Eskimos have a long tradition of great pass receivers, and Shalon Baker hopes to be the newest addition to that list. 79 receptions in 1995, 1,156 total yards, netting him an average of 14.6 yards per catch. Um, I have to give credit to my teammates, uh, my family, and the uh, Edmonton Eskimo organization who helped me uh, get here. Top offensive lineman this year, Baltimore's Mike Withicombe. A CFL rookie this year with six seasons in the NFL and World League, Withicombe was the anchor of an impressive Baltimore line that led the way for Mike Pringle. He was an obvious selection, six foot five, 300 pounds. And I just got to thank all the guys that I played with because I've had a really good time this year and I've just had the most fun I've ever had playing professional football. So, thank you. The sponge soaks up his second outstanding Canadian award. That is Dave Sabungis. His numbers speak for themselves. 111 catches, 1,655 yards, and 12 touchdowns. Oozing consistency with 271 receptions in the last three seasons. I said last week that I wanted to come here for the nominations, but more importantly, I wanted to come here with 36 other guys, and, and we did it last week, and they've been, a lot of them are here tonight supporting me as well as my owner, my coaches, and other people in the organization, and this award here is a real tribute for all of them, not just myself. And finally, the league's outstanding player, Mike Pringle, the Baltimore running back, no question, the offensive leader of the Stallions. Number one rusher this year for the second straight time, ran for 1,791 yards, 311 carries, scoring 13 TDs. He also led the league with total yards from scrimmage, 2,067. I'm glad I won this award because it gives me another opportunity to publicly 
thank my teammates. You know, I can never get enough of thanking them. Um, I, I have a little temper out there sometimes, and I don't think they really realize how much I love all my players, from the offensive line to the defensive side of the ball to Tracy Ham, everybody out there giving 110%. I like to thank them publicly right now. I mean it from my heart. I love you all. Congratulations to the five most outstanding players of 1995. And festivities continue here at halftime of the 83rd consecutive Grey Cup. Baltimore Stallions leading 23 to 13 over the Calgary Stampeders. And joining me now is the owner of the Baltimore Stallions, Jim Spiros. And Jim, you're one of the few owners I know with experience as a professional player and coach. Your view of the first half. Well, I tell you what, it's become a defensive battle. Both defenses have neutralized the offenses and it's broken down now to special teams. There is some weather factors here. I look for the same thing in the second half. We do know Doug Flutie wants to throw the football, so our defense is going to have to buckle down and keep doing what they've been doing in the first half. Speaking of special teams, let's talk a little bit about that, that NFL club in Cleveland moving into your backyard. What's going to happen? Well, I tell you what, we've got a championship caliber team, back-to-back -back great cups, great fan support. I meet with our governor, Paris Glendening, on Tuesday and with our mayor, Mayor Schmoke, to keep our football team in Baltimore. We want to be there. We deserve to be there. Flat out, is there enough fan support to support both an NFL team and a CFL team in the city of Baltimore? Well, it's going to come down to how much local support we get from our state and government officials to say, listen, you're our team too. Give us that vocal support. Give us that financial support so we'll be there. We're at Memorial Stadium for three more years with Elise. Well, I've been impressed as a football guy the way you, Jim Spiros, hired another football guy, Don Matthews, and gave him autonomy and picked the players and coaches he needed to build a team. But in the background, you've been selling this club to the whole Baltimore community. Hey Mike, I'm on their shirt tails. I'm here because the players on the field and this coaching staff. These guys are professional athletes at their highest. You know, they've stuck together. They're more mature this year. And I, you know, I want to make sure that they'll play in Baltimore and be appreciated because these guys are champions. Don Matthews was my best hire from day one. Well, let's talk a little bit about if Baltimore doesn't work out. What are some of the options out there for your club? Well, I tell you what, we, we've had a lot of inquiries from a number of cities. It's no secret I've been to Houston already. I've met with the Astrodome officials. I've also I've talked to their mayor, Mayor Bob Lanier. But right now, my objective is that I'm from Maryland. This team belongs in Maryland, and I'm going to leave it up to the government officials to make sure they keep us there. Now, Houston, of course, has been stung by the Oilers moving to Nashville. What's your view of American expansion? Are you guys, you've got a big meeting coming up on the 29th. What happens? Well, I tell you what, we have uh, four owners that are committed to you know being here in 1990 four american owners four american owners in four marketplaces i think we have some you know opportunities and markets such as portland milwaukee orlando miami so we need good owners it's not just about money you've got to have owners that are committed that get involved in the community and they they become part of, a part of that community that's key you can't be an out-of-town owner in this league because we depend so much on ticket revenues in the seats and if we get that, we can build on a television contract for the states. Television contract, that's a big part in any professional league. What happens next year? Well, I tell you what, we need to be on regional cable such as we are tonight on ESPN. We need to lock that in with the U.S. teams. You know, there's CBC and TSN in Canada. We need to develop our television markets with better ADI rating cities for the future. This year, 96 will come to be stability. From there, we'll keep adding. By the end of this, uh, by year 2000, I see us being eight teams in Canada, eight teams in the United States with a network deal. Eight teams in Canada, eight in the States. Who knows what the name of the league will be, but I guarantee you Jim Spiros will be a big part of it. Stay with us, please. We're Come right back. We're going to have Lisa Bowes paint the town 23-13 to 13 at halftime. Baltimore leading Calgary. We'd like to welcome you back to Taylor Field in Regina where we're at halftime of the 83rd Grey Cup and we sent our Lisa Bowles out to check out the nightlife here in Regina. Just like any championship game, there's a lot of stuff going on off the field and Regina is no exception. This is their first ever Grey Cup and these people are pumped. 
So come on, Doug, let's go check it out. I just hope we can fit everything in. Oh, thank you, sir. time here at Great Gun? I'm having a great time, Lisa. Are you having a good time? Oh, marvelous time. this is for Regina? Oh, I think it's good for Regina. The city's having a lot of fun. There's uh, lots of stuff going on. Tell you, Lisa definitely knows how to find a party. <laughs> I think she found every single one of them, Gus. Well, anyway, let's take a look at some of the highlights from the first half of play. And very, we talked at the top of the show the importance of special teams. And could Chris Wright break a touchdown? Well, look at this first punt of the game 82 yards, coast to coast, 4 3 5, 40 yard dash speed. Huge play, 7 0 lead, Baltimore. And with the two field goals after that, first and goal, Marvin Pope, the defensive lineman, in the offensive backfield, slips into the end zone. Great catch. That made the score 13-7, Calgary. But special teams continue to play a big role. O.J. Brigance with the block. Alvin Walton, the former Redskin, picks it up on the three-yard line, dives into the end zone, and it's a 17-13 Baltimore lead then at the end of the half. The little man with the big leg, Carlos Huerta, 53-yard field goal. And that's our score at half, 23-13. Now let's look at each team individually, Mike, and we'll start with Calgary. When they had the win the first quarter, it seems like Doug Flutie may not have gambled or thrown the ball down the field with the offense as much as uh, he would have liked. Well, he kept trying to get into a rhythm, but he couldn't because of the special teams play by Baltimore. And what happened was he went no huddle, that fire offense that they have, but he couldn't get any consistency. And all of a sudden, it's the end of the quarter, he loses the win, and they're losing the game 7-6. And when you look at Baltimore, defensively, they've gotten a lot of pressure on Flutie, but like the uh, Calgary offense, their offense is also sputtered. Both offenses, sporadic at best. Alfred Payton getting a lot of heat up the field on Doug Flutie. The Calgary Duke defense doing a great job on Mike Pringle. Like great championship games often happen, Gus. Field position, special teams, and defense. That's what wins championships. Because of the weather, the statistics won't be overwhelming. And you take a look at them, passing yards, 95 to 100 and. 42. Anything jumping out at you, Mike? Uh, the interesting thing is that Calgary clearly has the advantage in total yards, yet they're losing the football game by 10 points. The bottom line is we've stressed all night from beginning all the way up through this point of halftime is special teams. Baltimore is winning the special teams battle. So we're getting ready to start the second half of play of the 83rd Great Cup here from Taylor Field. And Baltimore Stallions have been in this position before. Last year they led the Great Cup against BC only to lose in the final seconds on a Louis Pasaglia field goal. Let's see if they've learned from their heartache of last season and let's see if they can keep this man 
Remember, calm down. Doug Flutie. Cold weather. He's had problems with the elbow. He had the tailbone hurt in the first half. He's going to try and stay as loose as he possibly can. Here's Doug's numbers for the first half. Not overwhelming, but certainly pretty good for the type of weather conditions we have right now. Baltimore will receive the football to start the second half of play, and they will have the wind at their backs. As you take a look at Mark McLaughlin getting ready to send it away. And Gus, you made the point at the beginning of the game, Calgary won the coin toss, deferred. That gives them the football with the wind in the fourth quarter of this football game. So this is a critical quarter for Calgary. They've got to shut out. Not shut down, they've got to shut out Baltimore in the third quarter. And for Baltimore, knowing that they're going to be playing into the win in the fourth quarter, they need to try to score as many points as possible. Got to get after it, starting with that guy right there, Chris Wright, on special teams, going through Tracy Ham and Mike Pringle. And one more thing they have to do is get the football to Chris Armstrong. Only had one reception in the first half. The 83rd Great Cup from Regina. I'm it's ever been played here in the province of Saskatchewan. Next year, it will be in Hamilton. And the year after that, it was scheduled to be in Baltimore. But the key to that, as Jimmy Spiros told me in the airport the other day, is that he personally owns the rights to the 97 Grey Cup, not Baltimore. So if he moves to Houston or Northern Virginia, whatever, he has the rights. And down on the sidelines, let's check in with Lisa Bowles. Thanks very much, Gus. Tyrone Edwards, injured running back for the Calgary Stampeders, is with me. Tyrone, your assessment of the first half. Well, I just think it's just been up and down. You know, our special teams needs to pick it up. And right now, you know, they only hurt us with two big plays, and that's it. Our defense is doing a good job. Our O just has to get on the field, make some long drives like we did last week, and just keep the intensity up. Thanks very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of the game. Thank you. Tyrone Edwards, guys, back to you. Now, Edwards played at Cal Berkeley, and he was behind Russell White. Remember, a couple years ago, White was a Heisman Trophy candidate at Cal Berkeley, and they consider him the back of the future, and with the way Tony Stewart has been fumbling the football this season, next year it probably will be a dogfight in training camp. Now you're pretty tough on Tony Stewart. He's a good football player, but like you've said and I've said before, the Achilles heel, the only downside to Tony Stewart is he will put the football back on the ground if you hit him hard enough. As evident in the first half of play. So because of the extended halftime, it's taken a little extra time to clear off the field here in Regina. So they're trying to get fans off the field, off the, the edge of the field, so we can get the second half underway. Any key players besides the principles that we've talked about that we may want to keep our eyes on to start this second half? Well, I think Chris Armstrong has got to get involved in the pass offense for Tracy Ham in the third quarter. He's with the win. I think he's got to go get him in the third quarter and try and get his slot back Armstrong involved. And on the other side of it, for Calgary, well, let's, let's face it, Doug Flutie's got to get on the corner and get some things going with Tony Stewart and his wide receivers. As you take a look at Tracy Ham now, he has won the Great Cup before. And he has played in the CFL for a number of years coming out of Georgia Southern where he won two national championships for Irk Russell. Rushed for a thousand yards in college, has great legs, although he is getting a little bit older. <laughs> you know what's interesting is people talk about quarterbacks maturing and generally people accept if you say that a quarterback was a scrambler but he gets older and then he scrambles to throw as opposed to scramble to run, well, the Calgary coaches are concerned about the... They'd rather see Tracy Ham scramble to throw. They feel like he's more dangerous using his legs instead of his arms. And in the CFL, both quarterbacks, usually the quarterbacks for each team, they call their own plays, and that makes the game even that much more interesting because the guys out on the field are just kind of reacting to what they see as they approach the line of scrimmage. It, it really is interesting because it, there's a combination. For instance, Doug Flutie generally will get signals wigwagged into him through offensive coordinator John Huffnagel, but whenever they get in that fire offense, Huffnagel even tells us he just kind of throws his hands up and says, well, it's out of my control. It's Doug's game now. 1984, Flutie led the Boston College Eagles over Miami and 
what they affectionately call in Boston the miracle in Miami when what's that guy's name he what's the guy's name he hit in the back of the end zone Gerard Phelan so we're still having some problems getting the second half started and we'll be back with the kickoff right after Chris Wright returns the football to the 44 yard line and that's where the Stallions will begin the second half first down and 10 from the 44 Mike Pringle the lone setback for Baltimore is Tracy Ham audibles at the line of scrimmage this is Pringle trying to get outside breaks one tackle stays on his feet turns a corner and he's finally pushed out of bounds at the 48 yard line Anthony McClanahan had a chance to haul him down but he just couldn't do it that's that little bounce play Pringle loves the play guard pulls out in front of him but McClanahan as you said forced him to bounce it wider than necessary and the pursuit caught up to him this is where the Calgary defense eats people alive second and long Two, second down, eight. Ham thought about going downfield, can't find anybody, runs, scrambles out of bounds, but he'll be shy of the first down. And Tracy's not happy with a couple of his receivers. He's looking for some help there, and he didn't get it. Look at him. Tracy Ham in the first half, 7 of 17 for 95 yards. <laughs> He's still talking to Gerald Alphen. And there's a name that we haven't called. Gerald Alfin was the all-star receiver in Winnipeg. Got released during the regular season and a good pickup by Baltimore. Got released because of money. It was a salary dispute. They asked him to take a pay cut. He said, no, thank you, and they sent him home to Atlanta. Josh Miller, end over end kick, takes a bounce, heads into the end zone, and this will be a single point. Marvin Coleman having all kinds of problems return today. So that's a single point for Baltimore, and with 13.54 left in the third quarter, they take a 24-13 lead. Little over a minute into the third quarter play as Baltimore gets an 80-yard punt by Josh Miller, and they pick up a single point, making it 24-13. Now, 80-yard punt, but Marvin Coleman allowed the ball to bounce into the end zone, and it bounced in front of him. That's two consecutive punts with the win where Miller had 69 and 80 yard punts, both misjudged by Marvin Coleman. Stampeders will take over at the 35 after giving up the single. And in the first half of play, the two all-star slot backs, at least one of them not having the kind of half he wanted. David Zapunches is five catches for 76 yards, but Alan Pitts only one catch for 16 yards. And, in, and the first time he played against Baltimore, he had eight receptions for 104 yards. I'm not convinced Alan Pitts is 100% healthy. He's had some problems late in the season, but still they've got to get the football to Alan Pitts. From the 35, four receivers on the far side, quarterback draw, Flutie straight ahead, and he'll pick up about seven yards. All down by O.J. Brigands. Now we talk about the ability of Tracy Ham to run the football. This little guy can also get it downfield as well. It goes without saying, either of these quarterbacks on the corner or on a quarterback draw, equally deadly. I mean, Doug Flutie made his reputation as the scrambling quarterback. When Flutie played against the Stallions earlier this year, he was 32 of 49 for 405 yards. There's numbers there, 12 of 26. Picks up eight, second down and two from the 43. Stewart. Over the 50-yard line, he'll be up to the 53. They're in the equivalent of what they call their double tight set, where they bring Jay McNeil, the extra lineman, in. And fullback Sean Daniel sneaks up there right there, as you can see, and starts the block on the corner. And Tony Storch just going to get in right behind the big offensive line. Pandelitis with a good block. First down. Gain of 10 yards. Tracy Gravely with the tackle. First down and 10 from the 53-yard line. Pitts in the slot. They run the counter trade. Stewart with the blocker in front of him. Gets spun around and finally knocked out of bounds by Matt Goodwin. 
Initial contact made by Charles Anthony on the force. Let's see what, while we have a chance, let's go down to Lisa Bowes. Alfred Payton, and we can off one block, getting hit by Rocco Romano on another. Stewart only picking up two yards. Second down and eight from midfield. Terry Vaughn splits to the far side along with Vince Danielson and David Sapungis in the slot. Flutie out of the shotgun. Underneath complete. This is Pitts. Allen Pitts down to the Baltimore 45-yard line. See, that's where Allen Pitts is most effective. It was a blitz situation, one-on-one -on -one coverage, and Flutie knows that he can use the, the size advantage. Look at the push-off, comes back to the football. That's 6'4", 210 on Charles Anthony, who's 6'1", 190, advantage Pitts. Pitts out of Cal State Fullerton had 100 receptions for 1,492 yards. And he didn't even play the last two games of the year. This guy has been the most productive player in the league two years in a row. From the 45, first down inside handoff Stewart. He gets down to the 39-yard line. O.J. Brigands with the stop for the Stallions. And let's not forget what's happening right now. They're controlling the clock against the wind. Peyton comes up the field. The ball's going to go back inside him. Shoestring tackle on Stewart, but it's an effective drive against the wind, getting close to the red zone, Gus. This is exactly what they said at halftime they needed to do. Pick up a five, second down and five. From the 40. Flutie rolling, gets rid of it. And he has a receiver. This is David Tapungis at the 32-yard line. Tracy Gravely there to bring him down, but Sponge picks up his sixth reception of the game. Flutie ends up a little deeper than he expected on this play. Maxie's pushing him, Brigance is pushing him, but he does a nice job throwing the ball inside Peyton for the first down to Sapungis. And when you talk about Sapungis and Pitts in the history of the league, no two receivers have ever gone over 100 receptions. Sapungis this year with 111, Allen Pitts with 100. Here's Flutie on first down. Again, complete Terry Vaughn at the 20. And he'll get down to the 10-yard line. Doug Kraft with the saving tackle. Baltimore is a man-to-man -man defensive coverage team, and that's one of the most effective plays against man-to-man. -man. It's a crossing route. Vaughn will come from the right side, cross underneath the left, and he gets the defensive back. It's caught in the traffic. That's Goodwin trying to cover the wide receiver man-for-man. And that's mismatch advantage Vaughn every time. Second catch of the game, game of 22 for Terry Vaughn. Now, only the third time in the history of the league that three receivers have gone over 1,000 yards, the third being Terry Vaughn. Here's Doug Flutie. Step. He wants to run it, and he is corralled at the 11 by O.J. Brigands. And he goes into a sack dance. <laughs> and the fans north of the border aren't real happy about it. Peyton runs himself out of the play, up the field. Flutie takes it down. I thought he was going to take off. Just okay, that hesitation gives Brigance the opportunity to make the tackle. Hog ties him and then does the dance. There it is. See, they had a curfew this week, Gus, so he had enough energy left over to do the dance that he couldn't do during the week. Second down and 10 from the 11 for the Stamps. Big play. Their opening drive of the second half. Flutie in trouble again. Trying to get out of the way. Flutie turns the corner. And it'll be shy of the goal line. Ball will be spotted at about the one. And that may be enough for the first down. And there's that 4-5 speed of Doug Flutie. The thing I like there, and you can see Doug is telling him how far. The, the thing I like is no hesitation. When he goes up the field, he knows he's running the football. This is when he's his best. Gets a great block by Tyrone Williams up the field. He gets to the corner, drops the helmet. Boy, that's a good play. Charles Anthony making the saving tackle for the Stallions. Good block by Tyrone Williams down the field on the linebacker, allowing Doug to get to the corner. Big, big call here. Third, not goal to goal here, as you said, Gus. They can still get a first down. Third down and in inches. Now, remember in the CFL, the defense has to line up one yard off the football. They're in their big set. 
Tony Stewart, and Flutie gets over the goal line, and it won't be a touchdown. No call yet. But he will pick up the first down for sure. Looks like he was in for our vantage point. Remember, it's not the helmet, it's with the location of the football. Football has got to break the plane. It's in his left hand. You can see him turning and churning, but that ball's still in his left hand. From up here, I thought he was in the first time, but Gus, from there, no way. I think that's a good call. Problem now is the measurement. And they do get the first down. Now, the interesting thing, you saw where the ball was lined up on about the three-inch line. Remember, in Canadian football, because of the one-yard neutral zone, the ball gets brought back to the one-yard line. He's churning and churning, but the, got down to about the three-inch line. It's brought back to the one-yard line, first and goal. From the Baltimore one. They got the big set in, Pope and Zizakovich. Flutie again over the right side, touchdown stamps. Doug Flutie, only his second rushing touchdown of the season. Makes it a 24-19 ball game. Reverse angle going off the right side behind Crysdale, Pandelitis, and Romano. Not to be denied. I remember one time you got on one of those horses in Baltimore. You would have to bring that up. <laughs> you? Oh my Welcome God. to the end of my broadcasting career. <laughs> Extra point is good. And with seven minutes and two seconds remaining in the third quarter play, Baltimore now leads by only four. Flutie is fifth rushing touch, sixth rushing touchdown of the season, and Baltimore now leads by only four points. Let's go downstairs where our Lisa Bowles is standing by. Thanks very much, Gus. Well, according to Stampeders linebacker Anthony McClanahan, the reason why Calgary's defense is having some trouble containing Pringle, this is his reason. Apparently, Pringle's got Vaseline all over him, especially his arms. Guys? <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not even going to make a comment about that, but, but obviously in the cold weather, a lot of guys generally will, will put substances on their body. But, I mean, he's, only, he's got nine carries for 48 yards. That's not too bad. That's containment as far as Calgary's defense is concerned. And here's a scoring drive. 11 plays, 75 yards, capped off by the one-yard touchdown by Flutie. But just as important is the time of possession. That was a critical, critical drive, and they did exactly what the coach wanted at halftime. Six minutes, 33 seconds. Chris Wright from the 25. Flags on the play. Wright with the seam up the middle. He'll get close to the 50, but this will probably be brought back. Yeah, I think they're going to get a block in the back on Greg Frayers. Bring it all the way back. In the first half, everything went Baltimore's way, especially on special teams. There you saw a crease, but it's going to be brought back because of the block in the back. And an illegal block in attendance today. 52,564. What a beautiful crowd here at Taylor Field in Regina for the 83rd the break up. Baltimore 14, 10-yard penalty, first down. And for Baltimore, number 14 is Jason Bryant, first-year player out of Morehouse. And he pushed Greg Frayers right in the back, easy call. And that pushes the Stallions back to their own 18-yard line. That's Alfred in motion. Play action. Ham to the near side. Robert Clark with the catch at the 30. And he'll get close to the 35-yard line. Robert Clark, after dropping three balls in the first half, comes out here in the second and catches his first. Did an excellent job running the defensive back, Al Jordan, off deep enough and then coming back to the football. Watch what happens now. Little hitch. Now come back to the football. There it is. Jordan laying way off in zone coverage and then compounding it by missing the tackle. Gain of 16. First down from the 34. Blitz. 
underneath Alfin with the reception, and he'll get up to the 53-yard line. Gerald Alfin picks up 19 yards. You know, the key to that play was tailback Mike Pringle picking up the blitz. McClanahan right up the middle to his right. Look to the right of that. Pringle picking up the linebacker, number 51, Alondra Johnson. That gave Tracy Ham enough time to find Alfin. First down and 10 from the 52 for the Stallions. Pump fake, Ham, and he has it batted down at the line of scrimmage. Gonzalo Floyd, who replaced Kenny Walker during the regular season when Walker was traded away, comes up with the big play. You can see Robert Drummond coming up from that. He was the intended receiver. Watch 84 and White. They've been coached this week. Don't try and get to the quarterback. Just keep the pocket and then jump in the air. Right there, Gonzalo Floyd. Now look at number two behind. That was the intended receiver, Drummond, and he hurt his knee. Second down at 10. To the near side, Tui below two. Looking for the first down marker, and he will be short. Anthony McClanahan with the tackle. But that is where Calgary's defense is so disciplined. Second and long, they get in the zone, they bring their rush men up underneath, and then they force you to throw the football underneath, and then they tackle you short of the first down. That'll make it third down and about a yard and a half. We're going, and they are going for it. As he goes over the left side of Mike Withicombe and Sharp Pordonish Withicombe, the most outstanding lineman in the CFL this year. Pordonish last year, and which what makes it more interesting, Withicombe wasn't even a starter at the beginning of the season. And Calgary seems to, they seem to think that uh, they didn't make it. it. That was a long yard right there. I think they're measure that. It was third and a yard and a half, in my opinion. Quarterback sneak is tough when you got more than a yard to go for. Look at that. It doesn't get any closer than that. What's the call? <laughs> First down. <laughs> Look at Spaziani. There's the eye of the tiger. Another great season for Frank Spaziani, another Penn State product. And while most of the attention goes to this offense of Calgary, his defense has won a lot of football games for this team this year, especially in the playoffs. Ham, plenty of time again underneath complete. Alvin hauled down at the 25-yard line. Tracy Ham doing a good job remaining patient, waiting for his receiver to break open. And the key was protection. The protection allowed him to be patient. He cleared behind Alondra Johnson, beating Al Jordan across the field. Excellent play by Baltimore from beginning to end. 23-yard pickup, and keep your eye on Alfin. He is a veteran receiver as Tracy Ham goes down with a whole lot of experience in this league. And an all-star. All first down after the 23-yard game. Underneath again! And a great catch! That's Peter Tui Pelotu, the backup fullback, sneaking out of the backfield, making the diving stab. But don't ever forget Tui Pelotu in your pass offense. A BYU running back, they all catch the football. Watch him extend. Two hands. Great job, duck and huddle. Great job right there. That looks like Cal Ripken going deep in the hole at Camden Yard. Little backhand. First down at 10 from the Stampeder 14. Here's Pringle. And he's stacked up at about the 13-yard line. Gosh, you know what's interesting? The first half was all defense. Here in the second half, we've seen our first two excellent drives, one by each club. Calgary takes six minutes off the clock the first time, and here comes Baltimore right back at you. Anthony McClanahan making the tackle. McClanahan out of Washington State. Led Washington State in tackles with 117. Was a second-team All-American player. Hey, he's very quietly had an excellent season. Seven sacks for Calgary. Second down and long. Ham throwing again. All day to throw the football. Steps up with running room. Ham towards the end zone. Touchdown, Baltimore. Great decision making by Tracy Ham and some fabulous blocking by the offensive line. 
What, what have we said three different times? That Frank Spaziani and that Calgary defense were scared to death about what? Tracy Ham's legs. What a great job making decision. He's got nobody open early. The pocket stays formed. Pocket stays formed. And now he says, okay, my turn. Turns it on. He still can run for an old man. Touchdown. On the season, Ham carried the ball 83 times for over 600 yards and had four rushing touchdowns. Extra point is good by Carlos Huerta. So the Stallions, they answer the bell and respond, and they take a 31-20 lead, 2.13 left in the third quarter. He's giving Tracy Ham great protection. That sharp for Donish on the left was the all, the most outstanding offensive lineman last year, and that offensive line doing a good job as Tracy Ham got into the end zone for a 13-yard score. How about the guy next to him, though? 66, 330-pound Neil Fort. We talked about BYU. He was an offensive tackle at BYU. And there's Tracy Ann. Scoring drive, nine plays, 92 yards, five minutes and three seconds. And both teams eating up a lot of clock. Capped off by the 13-yard run. That's two drives totaling over 11 minutes, about 11 minutes and 36 seconds. That's good offensive football displayed by both clubs. So this game turning out to be one of those contests where you get the feeling that whoever has the ball last may win. And Huerta sends it away. This is Terry Vaughn inside his own 10. Up to the 40-yard line, pushed out of bounds at the 41 by Jason Bryant. 30-yard return for Terry Vaughn. Reverse angle of the last touchdown. Tracy Ham doing a good job feeling the pressure from McClanahan and Johnson. Steps up, and at that point, he becomes a running back. Nobody's going to touch him. Good decision, better execution. But, Gus, did you see how the pocket stayed formed around them? They just kept blocking, 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 and Tracy made something happen. First down for the Stampeders at their own 41. Trailing 31-20. Flutie slips, gets it off anyway, and it's almost intercepted. Charles Anthony had the ball hit him right in the face mask on the deflection. If he would have been able to hold on to that, he would have sprinted right into the end zone. Coming late to Sapungis on this, Gravely will take a shot at him. He'll work back away from Gravely, and the ball will deflect off Sapungis' hands into Anthony's hands. Would have been six if he could have held on to it. Doug slips a little bit there again on that turf. Now watch the ball deflection. Oh, tip drill, Charles. You got to catch the football. That's six. Second down at 10. Flutie underneath to Vaughn, and he's stacked up shy of the first down marker. That's Irv Smith. And he comes up with the tackle, so Calgary will be forced to punt. And Irv Smith was out of the lineup this season with an injury, but Having him there is a very, very calming uh, force, rather, for this secondary. Well, he's a cover guy. He's a pure cover guy, and they're worth their weight in gold. He's an all-Southern all Division player out of the University of Maryland. Really a good football player. Local kid. That's right. Local boy makes good. Stampeders forced to kick again. This is Martino. Last punt, only 12 yards, kicking right into this win. Set up the return. End over end kick, fielded inside the 30 by Wright. Turns it upfield and watch him go. Chris Wright up to the 36-yard line, making something out of nothing. He is so quick, it's scary. He's like one of those water bugs. He's so quick if you're on the coverage team, you know if you blink, he's by you. Ray Biggs with the special teams hit. So the Baltimore Stallions get the ball back at their own 35-yard line, leading 31-20 to with 46 seconds left here in the third quarter of play. Ham out of the gun. They set up the screen. This is Clark. 
breaks one tackle, gets up to the 40 and the 41. Stu Laird with the hit, but missing the tackle, Kenton Leonard for the Stampeders. Leonard was shot out of a cannon, but misses the tackle. Clark on the screen, watch him from the right side. Bang, head down, misses the tackle. Good job by Clark getting some yardage. And I notice that Baltimore runs that screen a lot. How many yards are they trying to get when they run that play? Well, it's a first down play. You're trying to get it so you get six to eight yards and you get into an advantageous second down. They get six, second down, four, underneath, complete again. Tracy Ham just picking the the Calgary Stampeders secondary apart right now. That's Chris Armstrong with the reception. And I thought Greg Knox had a chance to make a play on the football. And that's the end of the third quarter of play. One more left from Regina. Quarter stands in the way of the Baltimore Stallions taking their first ever Grey Cup and bringing it back to the United States. They lead the Calgary Stampeders by a score of 31 to 20 as we begin the fourth quarter. Gus Johnson, Mike Mayock with you for the 83rd Grey Cup here in Regina. Stallions with the football at their at the Calgary 52-yard line. First down and 10. Hand off to Pringle. Gets over the 50 up to the, down to the 48. And take a look at the scoring by quarters and in the second quarter of play, Baltimore 16-7. So far in the third quarter, they outscore 8-7. Yeah, the big difference, obviously, is the second quarter. Good block there on Marvin Pope. Tackle by Alondra Johnson. But on the season, Calgary has outscored teams 197-88 in the fourth quarter of play. Play action, Ham underneath the Culver. And did he catch it? Are they going to give it to him? Boy, they Looks like they will. Skinny Culver. It looks like he juggled the ball from where I sit. Bad job by the refs and waiting to make a decision here. Let's see what happens. It look, the ball is clearly caught above the ground, but I don't know if he had possession or not. Let's see from this angle. Better look at it. I think hard to tell. The ball squirted at the end. I'm not sure. Game 14. First down from the 34. Hand off Pringle. Running over the right side. Keeps his feet going, and he'll get close to the 30. He got in behind big Mike Withycombe on that one. They pulled the left guard. You know, Withycombe had a couple of good comments in the paper today. There's the inside handoff. Withycombe out in front. Look at the block he had on Will Johnson. Just pancaked him right on his back. That's why he was the lineman of the year. You know, Gus, Baltimore had a curfew all week. Calgary didn't, and they asked Withycombe about it. He said, hey... Let them party. He said, this is a business trip for us. And according to some reports, some of the Stampede players were partying. Were they individual reports, or did you hear that from a third-party source? So Actually, I heard it from a coach. <laughs> Here's Ham underneath, and Pringle holds on to the football, gets up, and gets the first down. That's a huge non-call by the refs. When he was down, it was not a first down. When he got up, he picked up three more and a first down. Great hustle play by Michael Pringle. So Mike Pringle picks up the first down and the drive continues for the Stallions. Finley possibly playing his last game from the 23. Pringle again, straight ahead, and he gets body slammed to the turf, but gets inside the Stampeders' 20-yard line. That's Anthony McClanahan with the tackle. I'll tell you one thing, I think Baltimore is setting up the outside linebackers for the naked bootleg. Finley, straight handoff inside, pure power football. Big hit, McClanahan and Pringle, helmet on helmet. I think Baltimore is setting up the naked boot with Tracy Ham sometime soon on the corner. McClanahan had 38 tackles during the regular season. This is a quarterback draw. Ham straight ahead and he needed to get to about the 14 yard line for the first down and he's at the 15 right now. Maybe the 13 yard line. Comes the field goal team.
Calgary's rush defense has been the best in the league. 55 yards a game tonight against the best running attack in the league. They've given up 81 early in the fourth quarter. Carlos Huerta in to attempt a 22-yard field goal. Dan Crowley is holder. And it's blocked. Blocked at the line of scrimmage. And the Stampeders recover at their own seven. Looks like Shreko Zizakovic may have gotten a paw on it. 11-12 left in the fourth quarter of the Great Cup. Calgary trailing Baltimore 31-20. And welcome back to Taylor Field, 31-20. 11-12 left in the fourth and final quarter of play of the 1995 Great Cup. And the blocked field goal by Shreko Zizakovic gives the Stampeders the ball at their own nine. Special teams continue to be the story of the game. 22-yard attempt. The ball doesn't get up very quickly, and Zizakovic with his right hand makes the block, and it's recovered by Gerald Vaughn. That saves a sure three points, because Huerta is not going to miss from 22. I mean, he was 13 for 13 during the year between 20 and 29 yards. Taking an aerial look at Taylor Field here in Regina, and it is filled to the rim from the Gus Johnson blimp. <laughs> A beautiful night here in Western Canada, Prairie Town, Regina. There you take a look at Shreko. He wants to be an actor. From the right of your screen, the big hand goes up, he catches him right in the elbow. No question that ball was kicked too low, Gus. Way too low. Shreko Zizakovic, 6'5", 260. And they used all of his height on that play. So Doug Flutie starts from his own eight-yard line. First down. Out of the gun, to the near side, and this one down. Grant Carter bats the football down, and he has just been having an outstanding playoffs. He's really a good football player. Quiet guy. After they picked him up, their defense solidified. Carter, number 54, gets the big paw up right there. Almost catches the football. Great job by Carter. Carter, second year out of Pacific. Makes a second down to 10 from the eight. Here's Flutie again, passing. Steps up, wants to run. And he will not pick up the first down. Stifling defense of Baltimore will force Calgary to punt it again. Critical second down situation right there. Good coverage in the secondary. That will force a punt from inside their 10-yard line. Here comes Carter again. He's really quick. Good block from the inside out by Pandelitas on Carter. Little double team action. Stallion standing to get great field position again. So far, Doug Flutie, 16 to 32 for 188 yards. Watch this guy. And Chris Wright is standing at the 47. Martino gets off a good one. This is Wright. On the far sidelines, not a lot of room, but he will get inside Calgary territory at about the 54. And the reason that was such a great punt was not just the distance, but the location. Kicked in between the numbers and the sideline. You can funnel more defensive cover guys right into that area. That's how you stop a good return man. Fans here in Regina doing the wave. Now, this is Mike Pringle's quarter right now. Fourth quarter, 11-point lead, and you're against the win. Offensive line in Pringle. First down from the 53. Pringle turning it outside. Plenty of room. Mike Pringle gets down inside the 45 at about the 44. Upended by Gerald Vaughn. But Pringle picks up close to eight. <laughs> Did you see that? Gerald Vaughn started talking some stuff to him, and Pringle just turned around and pointed at the scoreboard. Gets outside contain, watch the hit, the flip right there. And then the jaw started. 
Mike Pringle. Picks up eight yards, second down, and two from the 45. Here he is again, and another first down for the Stallions. I'll tell you what this is. This is Don Matthews and Steve Barato, the offensive coordinator, throwing down the gauntlet right now to Calgary's defense. And what they're going to say is it's, we've got the best offensive line in the league, we got the best tailback in the league. Try and stop us. On the season, Stallions have been averaging 153 yards rushing per game. Pick up another first down there. You see Tracy a little bit on bootleg, but aside from that, here they come. From the 42, another counter tray. Pringle getting outside, turns it up, and gets down to the 34-yard line. Gonzalo Floyd had a shot at him in the backfield and missed it. Actually, it was Will Johnson had the shot, number 81. Plays off Drummond. Now, use your quickness and get outside. Just misses the tackle. Pringle strong enough to run through. Look at the strength in his lower body. Picks up eight yards. Great run. So far, 81 yards rushing for Mike Pringle. Calgary's got eight guys in the box. Here's Ham. Looks like a broken play. And Tracy Ham. He'll get back to the line of scrimmage. Anthony McClanahan with the tackle. Looked like Tracy wanted to check out of something. He had the same pre-read I did, which was that they were bringing the house. Too many people against the play called. Out of force, a field goal try once again by the Stallions on third down and two. This is a 41-yarder by Carlos Huerta the former All-American out of the University of Miami. Last one was blocked. But not this one. Carlos Huerta nails the 41-yarder. And Baltimore takes a 34-20 lead with 7.31 left in the football game. By Huerta makes the score 34-20. There's offensive coordinator Steve Barato. Great coach, but also, Gus, before the game today was very sick. He's usually down on the field. They bumped him upstairs because they didn't even know if he was going to make it through the game. Another field goal by Carlos Huerta makes it a 34-20. Baltimore lead so far. Huerta, four for six on the day. And in the playoffs, he's 13 of 20. He's accounted for 20 points already. I mean, let's add it up. You've got Huerta's points. You've got one scramble by Tracy Hamm for a touchdown, and all the rest is special teams. Baltimore's winning this football game on special teams and some good defense. Doug Flutie underneath. This is Tony Stewart. Stewart with the burst of speed, and he gets up to the 50. You're going to see Doug Flutie in the fire offense right now. No huddle. The game is in his hands. There's O.J. Brigance, gain of 15. Baltimore probably playing a little more zone now. Flutie, side-arming it out. Incomplete. Intended for Vince Danielson. Gravely defensively for Baltimore. Pure zone drop by Baltimore with a 14-point lead and just about seven minutes left. Doug chose the short pass here. Gravely does a great job breaking on the football. If you're going to throw that one, it's got to be on the sideline portion. It can't be inside. Second down and 10. Stampeders need to make something happen here. Flutie going up top for Pills, and it's intercepted. Charles Anthony with the interception at the 26-yard line. Bad read by Doug Flutie. Went backside. He had two guys going deep. Tried to force one in, and Charles Anthony had it all the way. Anthony had five interceptions during the regular season. None bigger than that one there. Big interception by Charles Anthony, and the Stallions get the ball back once again. 
on the Doug Flutie interception, and nothing has gone right for this Stampeders offense so far, but I tell you what, you got to tip your hat to this Baltimore Stallions defense. Excellent defense, led by Darrell Adrallen and Bob Price, defensive coordinator. Six minutes and 35 seconds left in the football game, 34 to 20. And Calgary, with such a good running attack, they're gonna try to take as much time off the clock as possible in hopes of being able to take that you precious see, trophy see south some, of the border. Some cop in New Jersey having to wear an outfit like that. <laughs> in Hoboken. First down from the 27. Pringle, search series, and he has plenty of room up to the 32-yard line. Both guards, Withycombe and Dixon out in front, just like we talked in the last series, and that is big offensive line, Mike Pringle, you guys got to stop us. And there's Charles Anthony and Alfred Payton. Gain of six yards, second down and four. Calgary's quarterbacks threw 12 interceptions during the regular season, six in the playoffs. Pringle again, first down as he sheds blockers and gets up to the 40-yard line. McClanahan with the tackle. You know, that's really a great stat, the, the graphic that was just up there. They threw 12 interceptions out of 724 attempts in the regular season. That's one out of every 60, yet they've already thrown six in the playoffs. And the big one coming when Doug Flutie threw four. Good block by Drummond out front. Look how strong Michael Pringle is. He just, he's only 195 pounds, but constantly running through tackle. Picked up eight, first down. Bootleg, hand, dumps it off to Skinny Culver, but he can't hold on to it. Marvin Coleman covering for Calgary. So, so far, Mike Pringle has rushed the ball 18 times for 95 yards now. The Stallions are 17 and one whenever Pringle rushes for 100 yards or better. And remember, this defense of Calgary only gives up an average of 55 yards rushing the entire game. Pringle almost doubling that by himself. Second down and 10. Ball on the 40. Play action. Ham underneath to Armstrong. Gets a great block by Drummond. But it does not look like you'll pick up the first down. Chris Armstrong sliding down about a yard shy of the first down. Gus, I thought the same thing you did. When Drummond made the block, I thought he was going to get to the corner. Crossing route. Good call. Ham hits him right there in the hands. Block right there on McClanahan. I thought he had it made. And once again, the slippery turf. Feet come out under him. That's a key play right there. Third down and short. And Stallions. They're going to go for it, relying on that big offensive line of theirs. That and the one-yard neutral rule. And Robert Drummond jumps off sides, and the drive will end here. Illegal procedure, Baltimore number two. Five-yard penalty, third down. Critical mistake by Robert Drummond. That will force them to punt the football right here in front of you. Number two, Drummond. Play was on three. He went on two. And to make matters worse, now he's got to go cover the kick. So Josh Miller will send it away from his 30, and he gets off a beautiful punt, but the wind just takes it over. Here's Coleman at the 30. Picking his way upfield. Finally goes down at the 32-yard line. Flags have been thrown on the play. This will be a no yeah, They're going to get Charles Anthony. We talked at the very beginning of the program, the wind on the punt returns. The cover team's got to be cognizant also of the ball being knocked down by the wind. Stampeders. No yards. Baltimore number nine. 15-yard penalty. First down. Charles Anthony. Now that's the second time Baltimore has been called for a 15-yard no yards penalty. Calgary Stampede bench, Dr. Robert Boyd, a 
And on the other hand, Stampeders have committed the same penalty and have only been flagged for five yards. First down and 10. Flutie to Stewart out of the backfield. He'll get up to midfield. Chased out of bounds by Matt Goodwin. We're down to three minutes and 43 seconds. Flutie knows he's got to get the football vertically down the field at this point. Gain of eight, second down and two. Here's Stewart again. Close to the first down. Clock continues to run. O.J. Brigance, middle linebacker, making the tackle for the Stallions. He's turned out a solid game, especially with the block punt in the first half. You know, Gus, we talked at the beginning about Don Matthews and how he built this club. Let's listen to him. Well, when we put this team together as an expansion team, we were able to choose our players and body types just exactly how we wanted them. So what we did was we used Calgary as an example of let's defend Calgary with the type of athletes we need. Therefore, we have guys like Tracy Gravely and Matt Goodwin playing linebackers. They're defensive backs playing linebackers. So uh, we match up very, very well speed-wise, but they were our target team when we put this football team together. So it couldn't be a better matchup for our defense. Pretty interesting tape, huh? No question. Two years ago, built for this game. Third down and one, Flutie. Submarining ahead, and he picks up the first down. And you talk about guys like Matt Goodwin, Tracy Gravely, O.J. Brigance, who has 10 tackles in this game, started off as defensive lineman. As far as I'm concerned, those three linebackers, Gravely, Brigance, and Goodwin, all of them could play strong safety. They have that kind of natural ability. First down from the 53. Time running out on the Stampeders. Stewart with the reception, but he gets nailed. Irv Smith with the hit on Tony Stewart. Baltimore doing a good job mixing up coverages. We're at the three minute warning. Calgary in trouble, 34 to 20 in the Great Cup. And left in the 83rd Great Cup, Baltimore hanging on to a 34 to 20 lead over the Calgary Stampeders. Baltimore has beaten every team in this league in their two-year existence except one, and that's the team they're facing right now, the Calgary Stamps. I guarantee you that man right there, Jimmy Sparrows, will trade those two regular season losses for a Great Cup win any day of the week. Look at him. He played at Clemson. He was a linebacker at Clemson when they won the national championship in 1981. Then he played for Montreal for two seasons before becoming a defensive coach with the Washington Redskins. The reason I like that guy, he's a football guy before a business guy. He cares. <laughs> Second down and eight from the 51. Here's Flutie over the middle, complete, but Allen Pitts, he gets punished and drops the football. That's Matt Goodwin delivering the hammer. <laughs> that was also Ken Benson. It was Goodwin and Benson. And Allen Pitts gave it up. Head starting to drop on the Calgary sideline. 2.48 left. Second down. Third down, rather, and eight from the 52. Here's Flutie, and he has it deflected at the line of scrimmage, and that's Alfred Payton once again. <laughs> uh, the Terminator. Alfred Payton, and the Stampeders turn the ball over on down. Just has not been their day. Number 56, 18 sacks. If you can't get there, get the hand up. And that's as big a play as there is in football right there. Stopping them on downs. Baltimore's ball. For Peyton, this is the fourth straight year that he's played in the Great Cup. And he may take a ring home this evening. Play action. Ham. Scrambling. Goes down at the 52. That was play action to run the whole way. 
You know, this whole Baltimore group, I'm so impressed with, starting with Spiros, who had the force, forethought to hire a football guy with experience in the CFL like Don Matthews. Matthews then went out and brought in not only his own staff, but also many players that were all CFL in this league under him in Saskatchewan and B.C. In what could possibly be their last year in Baltimore. The Stallions, Mike Pringle, at the, he's got room. Mike Pringle sprinting towards the end zone, goes down inside the 20-yard line. First down, gain of 37 for the CFL's most outstanding player. That's like dot in the eye at Ohio State right here. The cutback by Pringle. Look at the strength at 195 pounds, running through the tackle of Alondra Johnson. This guy's pretty special. Well, as Gus said a little while ago, Baltimore 17 and 1, and it just happened. 19 carries for 132 yards. First down from the 18. Here's Pringle again. Stacked up at the 15 yard line, and there's so many interesting stories surrounding this game with Baltimore probably playing their last year in the city of Baltimore with an NFL team coming to town. And, and you know, and that's a shame. They've got 30,000 loyal fans that come out every week to watch them play. They've really got a foothold in that Baltimore area. When they first began playing, they were the horse with no name. Now they're the team with no home. Here's Pringle down to the 10 yard line. One other thing they are, Gus, and that's Grey Cup champions. And that is, there is no question about that. A minute, 23 seconds left. Up 34 to 20. They have come out here in the second half and just completely dominated Calgary. Regardless of the wind or the field conditions or playing on foreign soil, it has not mattered. These guys have been focused from the first day of practice this season and especially at the beginning of this week. You said it well earlier, Gus, and that is that just getting here wasn't enough for Baltimore this year. Sometimes you have to taste defeat before you can appreciate victory. Talk to Don Matthews during the season, and he told me that he was not able to watch the Grey Cup tape of their loss last year to BC until about halfway through the season when they were getting ready to uh, face BC once again. It's a bitter pill to swallow. Here's Huerta, four of six on the day. A little chippy, and it's good. And they should be celebrating in Baltimore because the Stallions are going to be great cup champions. You know, I had a chance to talk with Don Matthews yesterday and he, you know, I asked him, what are the three things you got to do to beat Calgary tomorrow? Well, I think we've got to establish the run and D Calgary's got a good run defense, but we think we've got a good scope on them and we certainly have this to run. Two, we can't turn the ball over, especially in our end, but we cannot turn the ball over. And three, we need a big play out of Chris Ryden's special teams. And they've got it all. <laughs> they've got it all. Underneath complete Alan Vitz. Well, uh, if I'm sitting there with a little marker next to that, I'm saying establish the run, check. Turnovers, well, we had one or two early, but check. And lastly, special teams, big check. Dominated by Baltimore. 28-yard gain for Allen Pitts. Maybe a little too late. First down from the Stallions, 47. Here's Flutie. Firing it downfield, wide open receiver, and he can't get it to him. More pressure put on him by Grant Carter. Not enough has been made about Grant Carter. He's had an excellent year, very quietly, six sacks, a couple fumble recoveries. And what they tell me, he's just a smart player, very quick, really became the glow of this defensive line. <laughs> These guys are just playing for pride now. Gets off the block, puts the big hit on Flutie. How many times in that one series do you think they grabbed each other's face masks? As you take a look at the Calgary sideline, Jeff Garcia, the backup quarterback, has to only sit back and wonder what if he would have gotten an opportunity 
indicative of the night for Calgary. Allen Pitts unable to hang on to the football. Well, we've just been told and just been notified that Tracy Ham is the most valuable player of the game. There's Michael Pringle, who had a heck of a game, in my opinion. And also, David Sapungis, as you see the pass drop by pitch right there. David Sapungis was named most outstanding Canadian. He had seven catches for 84 yards. The Baltimore Stallions have come into Taylor Field. Maybe a thousand people rooting for him here. And they have done the job underneath again. Sapungis at the 20 yard line. 50 seconds left. 30 yard pickup. Finally starting to find his favorite route, which is the seam pass. But what's happened is Baltimore's just playing a soft zone, letting him throw the football. catch of the game for him. He's going to be a good football player. He's got a nice future ahead of him. And look at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Billy Gum, your most outstanding offensive lineman. Want a beer. <laughs> if he wants a beer, he's in the right country. No question about it, and I'm sure he'll put down a couple before this evening is over. Oh, man. Here's Flutie. Throw it in the end zone. Incomplete. Terry Vaughn just couldn't hang on. And with 23 seconds left. Well, I think in one play is a synopsis of the evening right there. Terry Vaughn with the drop touchdown pass. How about our boy Mike Buithicone, though? He might be tasting some champagne before he gets a beer. What do you think? Yeah, there's no question about it. Champagne out of the cup. Great year again for Calgary, only to end bitter disappointment. Stan Peters may have come into this game a little too confident. Firing underneath, incomplete. Flutie going down once again. Grant Carter with the pressure. And here's Don Matthews. He gets the Gatorade shower. As he shakes hand with shakes hands with his quarterback Tracy Ham, the brain trust there. <laughs> the Gatorade shower popularized Bill Parcells and the Giants in the mid '80s. Jimmy Burt dumping it on the Super Bowl. 18 ticks remaining. Flutie in trouble, rolling, lets it go into the end zone, incomplete. Alan Pitts, the intended receiver, and his former teammate is all in his face. Doug Kraft. And the Stampeders will turn the ball over on downs, and there you have it. Jimmy Sparrows and the Baltimore Stallions and Don Matthews have nine seconds standing in the way of their first great cup and only their second season in the Canadian Football League. Jimmy Spiros, number one. Give some credit to Darryl Adralin, the linebacker and special teams coach. His special teams, in my opinion, took the heart out of this Calgary team. Tracy Ham will line up and take a knee. Eight seconds left, 37 to 20. And that is your ball game. For the first time in the 106 year history, Canadian Football League, an American team will claim the Great Cup.
Let's go downstairs where our Lisa Bowles is in the middle of all the pandemonium. Thanks very much, guys. Mike Pringle. Mike, how satisfying is this, especially after uh, last year? Oh, th 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 I couldn't ask for anything better. Um, a, a victory in, in the style that we did it. Our offense, our defense, special teams, everybody came to play. I love it. The Great Cup is coming over on the other side of the border, but we're going to take real good care of it. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you. Mike Pringle, 139 <laughs> yards rushing, and I guess he summed it up. The Great Cup will be going south of the border, and will reside in the city of Baltimore for at least one year. And there's a man, Don Matthews, the architect of this system. It's been a heck of a week for Mike Pringle. Most outstanding player in the league, wins the Grey Cup, and he's up for a contract negotiation this offseason, so good timing. And the Cup is heading back to the States as this Baltimore team for the second straight year, advances to the cup, and this year they win it. Let's go back downstairs to Lisa Bowles. Okay, Carl Anthony, how satisfying is this, especially after all the team's been through? I don't know, we waited a year. With the disappointing loss at uh, BC, we came back, we knew it was playing against a great team. We knew the weather might have played a little factor, but we said if we can get on top of them and let Mike Pringle run the ball, we'll be successful. Outstanding job setting, uh, shutting down Calgary's uh, big, potent offense and especially the receivers in the two slots. Yeah, the thing we try to do is try to be physical with them because during the year we see that the team that played physical against them, they, they won. So we try to come out, play a little physical, try to get them out their rhythm, try to make Doug Foody run around a little bit, and then eventually try to just do a little, just throw the ball away. No question, unfinished business has been completed. That's right, unfinished business, baby. CFL is the greatest. <laughs> Canadian Football League, baby, number one, baby, number one. Thanks, Carl. Guys. Thank you, Lisa. For Don Matthews, the seventh time he's won a great cup. Won a great cup as a head coach with BC, also with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders right here in Regina, and now with the Baltimore Stallions. Let's go back down to Lisa. Thanks very much, Gus. Alfred Payton, how satisfying is this? Oh, it's real satisfying. I've been saying all week long, they can't block us up front. They cannot block us up front. We blow them off the ball, and it was, it was all the candidates talking about Calgary, this Calgary, but Baltimore, we had the best team. And I want you to know, Baltimore, we're bringing it home, baby. We're bringing it home to you, baby. That's our cup. That's our cup. The swag dog was all over Flutie. You talked about week. You did the job. I felt that was really important to get the Flutie, and that's what we was able to do to get him all stride and keep him out the park, keep him in the pocket, and uh, keep him from getting on his rhythm. I, had, I, I felt it was really important to, to hit it, to keep hitting him, baby. And I'm glad we got to bring it on home. Now. I know personally you're excited about a great cup because you haven't seen one in a while. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I have lost three, but this is how sweet it is. It's so sweet. It's so sweet. Now I'm going home. I'm going home now. Thanks very much, Alfred. Now let's go to the pre presentation of the cup and the most outstanding player. There it is, Lord Grey's Cup, which will be presented to the Baltimore Stallions in only their second year of existence in the Canadian Football League. And it's a trophy that this team has worked their tails off for, led by that man. Peyton really made a good point. He said, I wanted to get Flutie off stride. You don't always have to get sacks. You just have to get enough pressure to force the quarterback to do some things with no timing. And that's what they were able to do today. Interesting call on the most outstanding player. Tracy Ham had a great game, but, but he certainly should give half of it to that tailback lining up behind him, Michael Pringle. Tracy Ham was 17 for 29, 227 yards. Also had a rushing touchdown. Michael Pringle broke the 100-yard barrier yet again. Kenny Watson did a great job in the secondary today on the, on the slot backs. There you take a look at Ham, who won a great cup in Saskatchewan, but was a backup quarterback at that time. This is the first time he's won the cup as a starting quarterback. As they get ready to 
present the trophy to the Baltimore Stallions. That's Larry Smith. Presenting the trophy to the Baltimore Stallions. For the first time in the 106 year history of the Canadian Football League, the Grey Cup will be residing in the United States as the Baltimore Stallions go on to beat the Calgary Stampeders by a score of 37 to 20. They were 15 and three during the regular season, perfect in the playoffs, and they'll go home with the trophy. We ought to thank everyone we've worked with all year, Steve Lonchet in the truck, our producer, statistician, spotsman, everybody.